Good afternoon, everyone. If you'd just bear with me for a moment, I'm going to uh, link to our church Facebook pages. I think that is set up appropriately. Today is Good Friday, the day that we remember Jesus' death. There is no Easter without Good Friday. New life follows death. Joy follows sadness. We know, but we are still afraid. But God knows and understands our fear. So have courage on this day, trusting in God to love and to guide us. So let us near the cross and anticipate the joy of Easter. I invite you to pray with me. Creating, redeeming, and sustaining God, source of wisdom and understanding. In the midst of our distractions, let us experience stillness in this place. In the midst of competing voices, let us hear your word. In the many choices we encounter, help us to follow your will. In the name of Jesus, our teacher and our savior, we pray, amen. Now, as I mentioned, I decided to take advantage today of the fact that we had a plan B in place if the weather wasn't very good, but uh, I was thinking how in our Monday worship and reflections, I only took us up to the point of, of prayer at Gethsemane. So I thought, let's take time mid-afternoon to read through the Passion events and then gather again at 7 p.m. for a, a time of worship and reflection. So here and now, I'm going to, to take us through the uh, events leading up to the cross and and the crucifixion and uh, then tonight we'll um, reflect on that and and praise God in other ways as well with uh, uh, music and and reflection and and uh, in the peace and still of the sanctuary so I'm reading today from the Gospel of Matthew beginning at chapter 27 Verse 47. Nope, excuse me. Verse chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and they laid their hands on Jesus and they arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword. He drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen in this way. 
At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had, who had arrested Jesus, they took him to Caiaphas, the, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He is blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and they struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah, who is it that struck you? Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus, of Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it before all of them, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath. I do not know this man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and he swore an oath. I do not know this man. At that moment, the cock crowed. And then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out, and he wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of, all, of the people, they conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, they led him away, and they handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned. He repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is, it? what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver said it's not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money after conferring together they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners for this reason that field has been called the field of blood to this day then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet jeremiah and they took the 30 pieces of silver the price of the one on whom a price has been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
And Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water, and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some, thro some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and they put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and they kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits, two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, they were mocking him, saying, He served others. He cannot save himself. Sorry, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God? Well, let God deliver him now. He wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in this same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge. They filled it with sour wine. They put it on a stick and they gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Glendon McCauley, a parish minister and writer for the Iona community in his writings, Dirt, Mess, and Danger. He prayerfully reflected, why did you have to die? He wrote, why, Jesus, did you have to die like that? Why did you voluntarily arrange your own suicide? Couldn't you have found another way to make your point? Why did your story have to end with a pane of nails through your flesh and the death by inches of slow self suffocation? A glorious death, some of them say, but I'm certain you didn't think so at the time. To redeem the humanity that you love is what they tell me, but surely you didn't have to go to such an extreme. To win victory over evil is the popular rumor, but others have taken a stand for what was good, what was right, and they didn't end up on a cross. A sacrifice to the devil's demand is the theory, but if the devil could insist on your life, then that makes him more powerful than the God of heaven. Jesus, he writes, why did you have to die like that? What were you thinking when you volunteered to end it all and breathe your last? Could it be that you were showing the extent of your love for us? Could it be that you wanted to demonstrate the length that you were prepared to go? Could it be that in the end, you chose to forget yourself, to forget yourself for us, to forget yourself for all, to forget yourself for me? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? Oh, my soul, what wondrous love is this that in my humanity I am trying to understand. Jesus, I'll never be able to understand you. I'll never be able to come to terms with who you are. In the face of your love, my words are futile and wholly inadequate. In the force of such love, perhaps my silence is the only way to respond. Inscribed upon the cross, we see in shining letters, F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N, forgiven. God is love. For being who you are and loving me like that, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto you. Let us pray. Holy One, on this day and this evening when we remember Jesus dying on the cross, suffering pain and breathing his last, 
we come humbly before you. We come to say thank you, even though we know we, our words are wholly inadequate, we still say thank you for love so powerful that Jesus love made flesh would love us so much that he was willing to die for us. We come to say thank you that Jesus knows exactly what it feels like for all people to, who suffer pain and loss, fear and rejection, trauma and persecution. We take great comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. And in lifting up our sins and brokenness and laying them at the cross, your cross, we trust that the transforming power of your love will cleanse us, restore us, and draw us closer to you. Lord God, our world is still a place where too many people die at the hands of violence, where too many people suffer persecution, where too many people die alone and often in pain, where too many people die from invisible germs that take bacteria that take hold and ravage their bodies. Lord Jesus, be with them all in spirit, offering them comfort and strength as they go through the dark night of the soul. Lord God, you call us to be the hands and voice of Jesus and to bring healing and peace to all people. Lord, there is a long way to go, and we wonder if we will ever see your kingdom come and your will be done in all corners of the world. God, give us patience and hope. Help us not to give up. For Jesus never gave up. Help us to do your will, whatever that might be, that your glory may shine brightly in a world full of pain and suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Anne Weems, a poet, in her writings once said that even though we are lost in Christ's death, we are found in his rising. Remember also these words that Christ shared with his disciples. You are my witnesses. Each of us are Christ's witnesses. We do not follow a God who is above suffering. We follow one who enters into the depths of humanity in order to save us to the uttermost from the degradations of sin. In the words of Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion looks upon the earth. Yours are the feet by which he goes about doing good. Yours are the hands by which he blesses. May we remember and may we fulfill these words. And once again, I invite you to join me in worship at 7 p.m. tonight for further reflections and prayers. And tonight we will be recording live streaming from St. James. So may God bless you as you meditate on the word, on the events of the cross, on the love that Christ has poured out for each of us, for the salvation of the world. May God bless you in the silence. Until later.